We shall bring you further news as quickly as we can. Hello. Today, in our historical journey, we stop at ancient Greece, the cradle of modern civilization. And before we start exploring the rich heritage of ancient Greece civilization, let us quickly recap where we are on our uh, historical journey. In February, we started with the prehistory and first forms of uh, what we can call proto diplomacy which could be traced even to primates. As one of the leading global primatologists, Frank de Waal argued, even chimpanzees uh, have sense of fairness and empathy. They fought, but they often negotiated. With Homo sapiens, we got first examples of arts, technology, saved till our times in cave paintings, first tools, and emergence of spoken language. It is certain that our far predecessors managed their relation not only by fighting, but also by negotiating and uh, reaching compromises, the core of diplomacy. That was our focus in February. Then we move in March, and we focus on early civilization of ancient East develop in so-called fertile crescents between Nile in Egypt and Mesopotamia between a Tiger and Euphrat in nowadays Iraq. As we saw in March, early city-states, governments and organized state start, uh, structure started emerging. Writing which emerged in Sumeria was one of the key technologies of essential relevance for diplomacy and negotiation. And what is very important, there is a clear continuity between what started in Sumeria and Egypt and what we have today in diplomacy, from treaties and negotiations to diplomatic archives and diplomatic privileges an important wheel on this historical conveyor belt is ancient Greece. Important bridge between ancient East and modernity. Ancient Greece received tools and wisdom from the East via two main channels, from ancient Egypt and Hellenic culture and via Persia. Greeks fought uh, with Persians, but also they cooperated, they negotiated, they exchanged ideas. And this, these are where two bridges, Egypt and Persia towards Greece. Let us dive uh, deep in the era of ancient Greece, the cradle of modern civilization, which we can note, notice in uh, our daily lives. In the foundation of our modern time is ancient Greek uh, idea of rational inquiry, argumentation, and competition. In, in philosophy, our uh, fundamentals are still, could be still traced back to great Greek philosophers. As somebody said once, most of the history of philosophy is only a footnote to Plato. Or let's see modern science. Modern science owes its origins to the method of testing ideas, again developed initially by Greek philosophers and uh, early scientists. In politics, democracy is a space for battle of ideas, exercising power, and ultimately gaining trust and support of government through voting, is still as relevant today as it was in ancient Greece. Theater, geometry, 
astronomy, to name just a few subjects originated in, the, in ancient Greece. And let's even get to, to key terms of our journey, which we are discussing, diplomacy and technology. Etymology of the word diplomacy could be traced to the, can be traced to the ancient uh, Greece and the word diplo, diplo, not necessarily, it partially inspired the name of uh, Diplo Foundation, but Diplo means folded in two. And uh, with the suffix ma, ma, it's meaning an object, the folded document granted a privilege to the bearer, bearer often a permit to travel. Later, the term diploma was borrowed by Latin language, meaning an official document. And fast forward in the 18th century, the French term uh, diplomat referred to person authorized to negotiate on behalf of a state. And corps diplomatique referred to officials of group officials involved in foreign policy. In, in 1796, the term diplomacy was officially introduced to English language by phil philosopher and political scientist Edmund Burke. This is the etymology and journey of the term diplomacy from ancient Greeks, Greece till our time. Let's see about other term that uh, we have been using uh, in our journey, technology. Techne means art, method, tool, skill, craft. And logia means knowledge. And this is again another coin. And uh, words that we will be using a lot, telephone, telegraph, teleworking, nowadays popular, telecommunication, have again Greek on origins with the tele, far and uh, distance. Therefore, this interplay, this influence of the Greek culture on every, all, all parts of modern society is extremely important for understanding the current moment of development of technology and for helping us to see how technology and diplomacy can interact in the coming time. Among historians, there is ongoing debate if ancient Greece provided us with advancement or regress in development of diplomacy. A regress or advancement comparing to earlier practices in uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Persia, just to name a few. Professor Raymond Cohen, one of the leading historians of diplomacy, uh, said at one point that the practice of Greek diplomacy was quite rudimentary compared with the, let's say, Persian cosmo cosmopolitanism. Greek uh, diplomacy was rather provincial and unpolished. This is one of the views. Today we will unpack this notion and see where diplomacy advanced and where diplomacy retreated comparing to the previous practices. But before we dive deep into discussion on diplomacy and technology in ancient Greece, let us get a few basics of uh, location and timeline, what we are discussing, where is this period located? First, geographically, Greece, as you can see from the map, is uh, located on the southeast of Europe. And the position of ancient Greece was always bridged between Asia and Europe. And it is important for overall understanding of uh, uh, interplay, also diplomacy and war, for example. The ancient Greek world had, all, all, uh, had uh, over a thousand city states, independent small states. These states were Yes, independent, but they were also interdependent, which created a fertile ground for diplomacy. Therefore, you didn't have one hegemon. In some periods, there were a few hegemons, especially like Alexander the Great, 
but generally it was quite a few system. There was a very well developed system of the balance of power, which influenced a few thinkers that we'll see later on, and even Kissinger in our era. Therefore, this is geography of ancient Greece. Let's us see timeline, what were the main uh, periods. First, we speak uh, about period before fifth century before Christ BC. It's called so archaic period with Mykena civilization and other early civilizations. Then we have a classical period on the fifth and fourth century BC and Hellenic period fourth uh, to second century BC, influenced to the large extent by Alexander the Great, one of the great rulers and creating Greek influenced civilization outside mainland uh, Greece, in the Northern Egypt, in, the, in um, Asia, in all over the world. Now back to diplomacy. We can understand ancient Greek diplomacy through three personalities. I'm sure that you will come with some ideas that there are some uh, other personalities, maybe Prometheus, but let's start with, uh, with these three personalities and how do we understand them from mythology, God Hermes, protector of traders. His task was to negotiate between warring parties and other gods, his peers. According to Harold Nicholson, English author, God Hermes had a guard, uh, guardianship over diplomatic representation, which had sometimes uh, uh, unfortunate uh, impact on the reputation of diplomacy due to the fact that God Hermes symbolized for the ancient Greek the qualities of charm, which was positive, but also trickery and cunningness. It is certain that some of the modern suspicions about diplomacy and diplomats could be traced back to God Hermes and his not very favorable image in the, let's say, Ancient, uh, ancient public uh, culture, if you can call it that way. Therefore, God Hermes mythology, second important person, is a demosthen and it is rate related to oratory. He was one of the first ambassador, ambassadors of ancient Athens. His influence shows the importance of rhetorics in diplomacy in the ancient Greece. Sophist elevated rhetorics on the even higher level of human creativity and engagement. And rhetorics remains one of the key tools of persuasion and diplomacy till very day. And right, the last in this chosen trinity of great personality is the great author Thucydides, who can be assigned to writing. He was the first author of, on diplomacy. He wrote the famous history of uh, Peloponnesian War, one of the most detailed account of the question of power in early international relations. Thucydides is, is still part of basic literature for study of power, politics, and international relations. And one bridge to uh, our time is uh, his relevance, uh, current relevance was basically revitalized by Kissinger's writings on the balance of power in the 19th century, and obviously the practice of uh, power politics while Kissinger was the US uh, State Secretary. Who were, the, who were diplomats in the ancient Greece? We again find the three categories, and you can see we use the Trinity as uh, one of the legacy of uh, Aristotle uh, till our time. First were Proximus. Proximus were the resident representatives of one city states in another, but originally citizens of the host states. They were some sort of early honorary consuls, what we have the function of honorary consuls, but more powerful than today's honorary consuls. A Proximus would use whatever influence he had in his own city to promote policies of friendship or alliance, with the city he voluntarily represented. He was also expected to handle any high level political matters that came up as well as to provide support and housing for visitors 
and in particular to merchants. You can see the line from a Syrian we discussed of important commercial aspect of representation and Proxenos was involved in supporting commercial exchanges. They had certain level of immunities, for example, asylum, in case the sending state is turned against Proxenos. He had also free and safe travel during both peace and war. Proxenos held the prestige and it was hereditary function passed from the fathers to sons. And uh, during the classical period, we have a lot of, lot of evidence that uh, well-known uh, Athenian politicians held one or more uh, positions as Proxenos. For example, Demosthenes was a Proxenos uh, in Athens for the city state of Thebes. After Proxenos, the second group of the diplomats or functional diplomats were uh, heralds or kerikas in uh, ancient in, uh, in the Greek. They were regarded as direct offspring of Hermes, the messengers of the god. And they were general purpose messengers and masters of ceremony, sort of early head of protocols. Diplomatic responsibilities of heralds were to serve as a truce bearer prior to the start of the Panhellenic Games, Olympic Games, to make announcements at the Panhellenic Games. And they were a task of going ahead of ambassadors in order to secure a guarantee for their safe reception, that protocol is observed, which sometimes even today is not properly done. Also, they were responsible for issuing ultimatum and declaration of war. Generally speaking, heralds were masters of protocol and ceremony, which played important role in ancient Greece. And then we have a press base or envoys, the third category. They were senior citizens involved in advocacy, some sort of early public diplomacy. There were great orators who went for usually unpaid ad hoc missions. Delegation on envoys were often big, numbering 20, 30 people like nowadays uh, parliamentarians. And they were prominent representatives of sending state. What they did in many cases, they used to address the citizens and senate of the receiving state. They had public diplomacy exercise in persuasion. They try to persuade the elite of the receiving state about position of uh, their countries. That was a public diplomacy, some sort of early Twitter or media diplomacy that we have today. Therefore, we saw who were the main diplomats, main type of diplomatic functions. Let's see what was innovation in diplomacy. What happened, what we didn't have in the previous period in Egypt, Sumeria, and the Assyrian civilization, there was early multilateral diplomacy. It was developed around the idea of truce during Olympic Games and other common festivities, but Olympic Games were the most important. On that occasion, the representative of the city-states used to gather. It was a moment where they shared some sort of a common identity. And it was a good opportunity to negotiate. And here is a link to our modern time. The idea of common peace was born, or permanent peace between the Greek city-states. With many setbacks, the idea of common Peace remains claim or aspiration till our very days with one important bridge, fortunately unsuccessful, with the League of the Nation and our system today based on the UN Charter. One of the three pillars of the UN Charter is peace and security. Multilateral diplomacy occurred to a greater extent in the state systems, religious leagues, 
therefore neighboring communities sharing a deity, for example, a religious deity, and large number of military alliances, so-called uh, leagues established for defense and offense. One of the examples uh, of the well-developed multilateral alliance is the second Athenian confederacy, a defense uh, alliance created in 378-7. And its purpose was to guard against the growing fear that uh, Sparta at that time would uh, not honor the common peace of the Greek states. The founding charter, a famous decree of uh, Aristotle, described its purpose and defense character and inviting other to join, including barbarians. And we will hear now uh, from the Aristotle, uh, what was his message at that, that time? Uh, what was his decree that he sent uh, to the all of those who had the intention to oppose the uh, power of Sparta? If anybody attacks those who have made the alliance, either by land or by sea, the Athenians and the allies shall support the latter both by land and by sea, with all their strength, as far as possible. Another uh, invention of the ancient Greece was uh, cryptography or uh, stena uh, uh, steganography. Uh, one exercise which I couldn't uh, do because of my hairstyle. This is, was the message written on the bold uh, scalp. It dates back to the 5th century BC. And steganography is one of the oldest methods of concealing secret information. According to Herodotus, it was the first used by the Tyran Histius, who shaved the head of a servant before tattooing a message on his scalp. When the hair had grown back, the servant was sent to deliver his message. And that time was a warning for the, the other city-state of impending attack by the presumably slow-moving Persian army. That message was relieved when the servant uh, arrived. His head was shaved, and they basically read the tattoo the message. That was one early primitive but functional uh, way of doing uh, cryptography. Then there was early telegraph called Frictoria and Perseia. If you can recall configuration of the Greek land, there is variety of mountains and hills uh, and was convenient for conveying messages. Frictoria was a network of towers built on selected mount mountain hill stops so that one tower, Victoria, would be visible to the next tower, usually approximately 25, 30 kilometers away. Tower were used for the transmission of a specific prearranged messages. Uh, flames uh, lit on the tower, and then the next tower in succession also explained. It was early telegraph. Later on, we'll see how Napoleonic telegraph was designed uh, more or less along the similar line. Aeschylus, in the tragedy of uh, Agamemnon, describes how the message for the fall of Troy arrived in uh, uh, Mycena via the use of a uh, Fitoria network. In the second century BC, the Greek engineers, for them, uh, uh, Cleoxenes uh, and Democletus uh, invented Perseia, Pirsos, entomology is a torch, fire. The letters of Greek alphabet were listed on a table. Each letter, as you can see on the, on the slide, correspond to a row and a column on the table. By using two groups of torches, five torches in every group, the left indicated the row, and the right of the column of the table, 
they can send a message by defining a specific letter through a combination of light torches. Therefore, there was additional level of sophistication uh, in that context. Firsea was made famous by the historian and scholar Polybius, who developed it further. Divide, uh, this device you use for uh, telegraphy, from uh, cryptography. By using this te technique, we shared with you the Twitter riddle. We ask you, can you describe number 142435 by using a polybius square, you can find the solution. In this case, it's the name Diplo. That was, just, was a small test, and thank you for those of you who answered. Now back to technology. The next major invention was hydraulic telegraph. And we will see how, how basically hydraulic telegraph operated. Here we have, uh, you, as you can see, two soldiers. They have water cylinder. They uh, signal uh, when they start operation, putting the water simultaneously on both sides. And signaling the, this stick in the middle of the cylinder is going simultaneously down, uh, down uh, from, the, from the, as water uh, is going out of the water cylinder. They again signal with a torch, as you will see in a, in a few seconds, they signal when they stop when they stop uh, um, uh, water. And by having this simultaneously running, they can read predefined messages. Obviously, there is a need for a high level of synchronization between uh, two messengers, usually staying uh, away uh, uh, along the quite, quite long distance. As you will see in a few seconds, they will signal that they stop water now immediately. Therefore, what's happened now, they can read the message. And this is how it was uh, this early semaphore system was used. It was used also by Romans in the first Punic War to send a message uh, between Sicily and, and uh, Carthage when it was, when it was uh, starting and uh, taking, uh, taking, taking off. Uh, those were technological developments. Let us see from uh, Katarina if there are any comments, questions so far before me, we move to the other aspects of uh, diplomacy and technology in the, in, the, in the history of ancient Greece. Katarina. Hi, hi, Jovan. Hi, everyone. Um, so far, we haven't received any question. Um, we, however, discussed the significance of writing to diplomacy, how it uh, bridged distances and uh, how um, it remembers better than messengers. And then we um, talked about the creative methods of communications and agreed that we that they were quite fascinating. So all from my end for, for now, I am looking forward to your questions and comments in the chat. Back to you, Jovan. Therefore, the importance of the writings is, uh, is, is highlighted. And obviously, in the ancient Greece, uh, writing uh, got to the next and the new level of, uh, of uh, sophistication. What was interesting and what we'll see in our bridge towards the Roman Empire, and especially Byzantine time, uh, uh, Roman Empire increased technological side of uh, this interplay between uh, diplomacy and technology, reducing slightly uh, relevance of the of uh, diplomacy or the human side of uh, these developments. And what we have to keep in mind as we are going through the through the history through the this period is this conveyor belt. What started in Sumeria moved to the ancient uh, to Assyria to ancient Egypt, and via this bridge to the, to the Greece. We can see later on via Rome, via Byzantine, it moved to Renaissance diplomacy, and then to Europe and to our modern time. Let's see another tension that existed in uh, ancient Greece between diplomacy and democracy. It was early tension. 
And this is probably the reason why Professor Cohen argues that it wasn't a glorious time of diplomacy. In Greece, there was strong focus on openness and transparency. And it is one of parallel between ancient Greece and our era. Ancient Greek diplomacy was one of the most open diplomacies ever practiced. Envoys addressed public gatherings of citizens of the receiving states, as you can see from the slide, by using the art of rhetorics. Treaties and contracts were public. They were inscribed on the stones or bronze pillars, so-called stelae, located in temples or other sacred places. We should admire transparency, especially about the treaties uh, which they had. Paradoxically, at least at first glance, the openness created one of the major weaknesses of ancient Greek diplomacy. Namely, facing the foreign public, envoy were advocating more than negotiating. This is important lesson for our time. Their task was to persuade the wide population of the receiving state, not to negotiate compromise with the opposing side. Today, public diplomacy conducted on the internet also focuses a lot on advocacy. And we know, and uh, history teaches us, the major diplomatic breakthroughs are usually achieved with some sort of translucent diplomacy. The public is aware the negotiation is going and their result, but it does not follow the process it, it unfolds. And this is usually this transparency, not translucency, is considered one of the weaknesses of ancient diplomacy. And today, when we are discussing e-diplomacy, and very often uh, demands for full transparency, we must always consider what is the primary purpose of diplomacy, and it is achieving peaceful solutions for conflicts through compromise. And often, it is not possible to achieve compromise while negotiating them in public eye. And that is an important lesson to learn. Obviously, modern diplomacy and our era cannot and should not tolerate secret diplomacy, although it's happening, unfortunately. However, some form of translucent diplomacy should be exercised more as a way for finding compromise solution slightly removed from the choreographed public diplomacy increasingly conducted online. This is important warning from the experience of Greek diplomacy and failures of their negotiation. We can learn learn that and we can reflect, I'm sure in the chat, you can reflect on, on this importance. Let's see what was happening uh, in other regions. We are following obviously this, this dynamics, but we have the other regions and uh, in China, the Qin dynasty managed to unite most of the country for the first time after 500 years ending so-called warring states period. Although lasting for only 15 years, the Qin, Qin dynasty uh, managed to establish highly functional and centralized governments, develop a legal code and written language. And one of the major achievements of the Qin dynasty is that they gave the name to the country. China, for the first time, became China. After the Qin dynasty, we have the Han dynasty. They govern according to Confucius principles. And Confucius got the prominence. The Han governed for four centuries, consolidating unity of the country. And this can be remembered as the golden period of China. During the Han Dynasty, diplomatic relations with many different Asian states were established. All of those countries received the Chinese 
delegates at that time, representatives, ambassadors. And like today's Silk and Road Initiative, diplomacy was used to secure trade routes through less so-called less civilized regions to the West. For China, obviously, those regions were civilized and famous early Silk Road towards Europe, towards the Roman Empire was established as well as sea routes to India. Therefore, there is an interesting analogy with the Belt and Road Initiative of modern China. The Chinese diplomacy of that period was mainly influenced by three thinkers. Well, we are familiar with uh, Sun Tzu and his art of war, advocating both war, but also diplomacy, smart use of force, negotiation, cultivating uh, relations with the other actors. We already mentioned uh, Confucius, whose ethical teaching preached for the respect of the superior states, the observance of legitimacy of authority on various levels, but also authority and the commitment in the relation with the other entity. He made distinction between cultural Chinese and barbaric, barbaric foreigners. We had it also in ancient Greece, these barbarians that was, that was us and them dynamics, which unfortunately exist till very days today. What is important, Confucius put central law to rituals and protocol as the high level of governing, not only in diplomacy, but also in internal way of running China. We have one of early philosophers, Mencius, stated the best way for a state to exercise its influence abroad is to develop a society worthy of emulation by admiring foreigners. They were the first sort of uh, public social engagement diplomacy. Another important part is India. In India, uh, there was a so-called Maurya Empire, which uh, reached, uh, reached its apex during the uh, ruling of Ashoka the Great in the third century BC. He ruled over most of the subcontinent, except for its southernmost part, close to Sri Lanka or Ceylon today. Ashoka was a keen Buddhist, and apart from promoting the religion in his own realm, also sent diplomatic missions to Hellenistic Kingdom of Asia. Alexander the Great came close to India and he tried to sp spread the Dharma, cosmic law and order, as a set of political and moral ideas. It was done also for promoting, obviously, political influence and trade. And he was uh, the ruler who tried to overcome isolation of India. Uh, he ruled until the Raiput Kingdom from the 8th century when India, especially North India, got again isolated. And uh, that, was, that was one of the important developments. Okay, we did uh, this journey through, through history and uh, through developments in ancient Greece and makes two excursion to China and India. I will again ask Kat, uh, Katerina, uh, to see if there are comments and questions before we move to the last more relaxing part of our session today. We'll have some drinks. Katerina. Yes, thank you. We have received uh, a number of questions and comments and there was a question regarding the hydraulic telegraph you spoke about, um, there was a question, what was the distance between the messengers for reading such m messages as it looks logistically complicated? And then uh, there was a question for you, have you tested any of these um, methods of uh, communication? Um, then um, Deirdre, she referred to some of the modern uses of fire signals, the Martello Towers on the south coast of England, early 19th century, set up when there was a threat of invasions by Napoleon. 
And um, uh, then uh, Ronald noted that some people claimed that in fact, we don't live in a, the democracy, that we are actually in a republic. And even that is stated in the USA constitution. It was said that a true democracy would lead to anarchy. And as true, the democracy required that everybody participate. And is that logic correct? And then the discussion uh, has just unfolded and I will follow it more closely from now on. Well, the, for the for the hydraulic telegraph, it was hydraulic in the in the function, but the the key element is the visual visibility of uh, of the fire of torches because they had to signal when they uh, that they uh, basically open the wallet and then when they close it. Therefore, visual, which is approximately twenty to thirty kilometers. And in ancient Greece, it was relatively easy because of many mountains and it was possible to to do it. Have I tried any of these methods? Um, uh, no, some of them I cannot use because of my scalp uh, and the hairstyle. Uh, the other uh, I plan uh, plan to to use, uh, and uh, that's that's definitely will be will be an interesting interesting exercise. And the question of democracy and um, uh, republic or res public or uh, public affairs is an interesting one, and this is ongoing debate. Uh, from Plato, from his uh, argument in the, in the Republic that uh, rulers or philosophers should rule society, he wasn't very enthusiastic about democracy, much less than Aristotle and much less than, than Pericles and people in the, in the ancient uh, Athens, which pra practiced probably the most developed form of, of democracy. Later on, uh, the founding father of the United States, uh, Madison, Hamilton and others were inspired by this debate. And this dilemma, to what extent that democracy could lead into anarchy? And we have that discussion open till our very days. We have elements, uh, very successful elements of direct democracy here in Switzerland. Uh, but uh, there are also more and more examples of limits of democracy or manipulation of diplomacy and democracy if it is only reduced to the elections. Therefore, we should undust some of the writings uh, from uh, definitely Plato, uh, but or also Aristotle and other uh, 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 post-Platonic uh, thinkers on the question of the human nature, democracy, and uh, what we as uh, organized humans in rest publics, in republic, can do in order to maximize freedoms, human well-being, and uh, possibilities for peace. And that formula, we are still searching as uh, humans, as a society for this formula. Thanks for excellent question. Now we're going to close it uh, with, uh, with uh, um, our uh, small drinking uh, rituals. In, uh, as you can see, I have a red wine here and I have some water. And I'm sure that uh, my French and Italian friends will be horrified when I start mixing uh, water with, uh, with uh, wine. And it was the typical way how in ancient uh, Greece, they prepare wine, they dil diluted wine. One argument is that uh, by, uh, they didn't pour water into wine, they basically did the other way around. They uh, wanted to purify water by putting some wine and alcohol in it. But wine was divine in uh, ancient Greece, according to mythology they, that came to uh, our time. Wine was invented in inverted commas, although it existed in Mesopotamia, as we discussed last week, by Dion uh, Dionysius. And he was uh, uh, father of the uh, wine industry and father of enjoyment and indulgement in the, in the in wine and other aspects of life. The Greeks became uh, passionate uh, wine drink drinkers and there was art of uh, drinking uh, wine. Let me start, start. I don't know, uh, I have to read more carefully. If you first pour wine or water, but let me start with, uh, with wine. Uh, and uh, there was a drinking wine center mainly around so-called symposium gatherings gatherings of adult males uh, ranging from the different functions, from simple socializing uh, 
to uh, mold wild parties, but one important part was that it was a time and place and space for philosophical discussions. And the key in the writings uh, uh, which you can get today is to find the right balance by becoming a bit drunk, not too much, but also uh, reminding us sober for engaging discussion on philosophy. And we have a few major books. Uh, one of them is by Plato on symposium and uh, issues and ideas that were discussed uh, during this uh, party. Uh, there are various theories that there should be one fourth, one third, one eighth of water in wine. I will put just, just a bit. Let me just taste for you. The, the smell and bouquet is basically diluted, but um, um, great cheers from uh, Geneva and from this uh, journey to ancient uh, Greece. Cheers, have a nice day. When you take next time, uh, probably not diluted wine, think about what we can learn from ancient Greece and all ancient civilization. We can learn a lot. Once more, cheers. Oh, it was not bad. Okay, that was, uh, that was all for today. If you don't have any Katarina questions and comments, we are uh, closing today's session. You will receive in the follow-up follow some notions about the right ratio. For example, Odyssey argued that uh, you should have 20 parts of water to one part of wine, which was very, very diluted. Katarina, over to you. We haven't received any question, uh, but so, some people actually did not agree with, with what you just did, but yeah. I, I guess they are, uh, they, are, uh, they are definitely French. French is horrified with this practice. I think people from the Balkans, from Dalmatia, they may some, sometimes dilute, although more with white wine and sparkling water and from Germany, but uh, well, we will, uh, will uh, We'll, we'll send definitely a mes message to ancient Greece that it was not proper practice and that they, next time they should uh, revisit it. Uh, next uh, month, we are going to move to, to Rome and in particular Byzantine diplomacy and Byzantine civilization as one of the most advanced form of diplomacy. Stay tuned, have a nice uh, spring, uh, try to find the time to relax with the uh, real wine, with beer, with diluted wine, with the Coke, with coffee, whatever is a practice and your preference. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the end of the uh, month of May for Rome and Byzantine diplomacy. Bye bye. We shall bring you further news as quickly as we Thank you.